Okay, so I am delighted today to, to represent to uh, present Dr. John Wedlake. Uh, he and Ed and I have gone from being friendly uh, since I have succeeded him on the city council to being friends. And uh, we go to coffee occasionally and spend time together. And I really enjoyed getting to know him better. Uh, last night we were texting back and forth. And he said, what do you want me to talk about? And I said, well, what do you want to talk about? And told him that my mom recently has had a uh, diagnosis and he said, well, I'll talk about that then. And I have a PowerPoint ready for that. And so here's Dr. John Wedlake. You'll need, you'll need to turn that microphone on, it looks like. Test, can you guys, oh yeah, yeah, all right. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity uh, to come back and speak to you. I, I've been a guest of this lunch uh, multiple times in the past. Um, I know, most of you in this room um, in some professional capacity or another, uh, but for those of you that don't know, uh, as Kevin said, I'm Dr. John Wedlake. Uh, first and foremost, I'm happy to report that I got three out of five of Rachel's trivia questions correct <laughs> today, so take that for what you will. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but for those of you that don't know, uh, I'm Dr. John Wedlake. I was, uh, I was born and raised here in Stillwater. Uh, so this is this is very much home for me. Um, graduated from Stillwater High School in 1998. Um, did a tour in the military as a paratrooper and um, army ranger uh, when I was much younger and in much better shape. Um, finished my military service out and came promptly back to Stillwater to start my degree in microbiology and molecular genetics here at Oklahoma State. Um, graduated there and then matriculated to the College of Medicine at OU. Nobody's perfect. Um, and finished out there and uh, came back here after my uh, medical school and residency and postdoc training back to Stillwater in 2015 and opened uh, Stillwater Neurology, um, which is the clinic that I am the owner proprietor of. Proprietor of um, and we've been here ever since. So it, it was a longtime dream of mine to come back to my hometown, the town that's been very good to me and uh, provide my craft uh, for a lot of the people um, that I grew up with. In fact, some of you in this room have known me uh, since I was a child, um, for better or worse. Um, I was a much better child than Chris Campbell, though. Um, there, are, there are school reports that'll prove that. So, <laughs> so uh, with that, um, Kevin asked me if I would come and, and uh, discuss uh, dementia uh, as a topic today, a topic that has gotten a lot of uh, a lot of news, um, especially of late, with certain treatments that um, have recently been approved for the treatment of dementia and Alzheimer's disease specifically. Um, and so that's what we're going to kind of delve into today. Um, uh, on the advice of general counsel, I am uh, happy to report I have no financial disclosures uh, or conflicts of interest uh, in this talk. The lawyer should be happy now. Um, so learning objectives of this talk, and we're going to kind of fly through this stuff because I really want to open the floor to questions. I, I know that there are people out there that um, are either uh, personally touched by dementia or have loved ones that may be suffering from uh, a disease that results in dementia. So I really want to kind of get through this pretty quick so that we can discuss uh, <clears throat> any, uh, any personal questions that people have. Um, so dementia. So I start the talk with defining what that term means, because there seems to be some confusion about uh, what that actually means. What is dementia? Um, and how does dementia uh, differ from something like Alzheimer's disease or progressive supranuclear palsy or whatever the case may be? And dementia quite, quite simply is uh, a state characterized by decline in cognition involving one or more cognitive domains. So i.e. learning and memory, language, executive function, complex attention, perceptual motor, or social cognition, and this is the important part, sufficient to cause some kind of functional impairment. So I get, a, I get the question a lot. So <clears throat> somebody says to me, well, I've started to forget, you know, why I walk into a room. You know, I walk into a room I'm like, what am I, what was I doing? What am I doing here? Or um, I've started realizing that I'm not remembering where I'm putting my keys every day. And they say, well, do I have Alzheimer's disease? And the answer to that is probably not, probably not. Um, the big part of this definition is, is that dementia by definition has to cause some kind of functional impairment in activities of daily living, 
or what we call instrumental activities of daily living. So if you are having a difficult time remembering uh, where your bank is on a regular basis, um, that, that <laughs> well, I'll, I'll direct you to the dunk tank that Pat Zimmerman is about to be sitting in. Um, <laughs> that's all right, that was a paid advertisement. Um, so, so again, the, the take home point here is, is, is it must cause functional impairment. The, fu the cognitive deficit must cause some kind of functional impairment. So again, you know, when, when talking to people about what dementia is and how it, how it presents and why it may, why it is similar to Alzheimer's disease, the answer in that is, is Alzheimer's disease is just a specific kind of dementia. So, cause the other question arises, well, what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? Well, again, the answer is that Alzheimer's is just a specific kind of dementia. Dementia is a very generalized term. There are other kinds of dementia. As you can read here, progressive supranuclear palsy, multiple system atrophy, primary progressive aphasia, CBD, cortical basal degeneration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the take home point here is, is that dementia is a kind of an umbrella term and the specific diagnosis would be one of these listed here. Now, Alzheimer's disease is the one that is the most common by far and is the one that most people have heard about or, or uh, have experienced with. Um, and so that's the one we'll kind of focus on today because overwhelmingly Alzheimer's disease is the most common neurodegenerative condition that, that, uh, that, we, <clears throat> that we deal with today. So Alzheimer's treatments, um, we're going to get into presentations here in a second, but again, I wanted to kind of go through this really quick about um, how we treat um, Alzheimer's disease and why we do some of the things we do. Um, the best treatment for Alzheimer's disease is actually prevention. Um, there are specific treatments on the market in terms of pharmacology, uh, in terms of medication that can delay progression of memory loss in patients suffering from Alzheimer's disease, uh, but there is no cure. Um, and that statement rings true even today. We still have no cure for Alzheimer's type dementia. So the logical question is, is what are the things, Dr. Wedlake, that I can do to help minimize my risk of developing Alzheimer's disease? Well, and you can see a lot of them listed right here. Uh, diet. So there is, a, there is still a raging debate on if there is a diet that minimizes risk of developing the cognitive deficits that come along with, with Alzheimer's disease. That, quite frankly, that literature is kind of split. I am of the opinion that healthier diets, um, specifically something called the Mediterranean diet, um, is beneficial for a whole host of health reasons, um, cardiovascular benefits to eating low-fat diets, um, in addition to the cognitive benefits that seem to arise from eating diets that are higher in healthy fats, you know, saturated, uh, non-saturated fats are things that we generally want to stay away from, trans fats certainly so, but the lower chain fatty acids uh, that can be seen uh, in the Mediterranean diet specifically seem to be somewhat protective um, against developing the cognitive deficits of Alzheimer's disease. Exercise, exercise is unequivocal. That's not even up for debate. Uh, the more you exercise up to a point of 30 minutes of aerobic exercise three times a week uh, has shown unequivocally to the yeah, Marsha's cheering back there um, has been shown unequivocally to lower your risk of all kinds of health uh, 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 maladies as we get older, but Alzheimer's disease specifically. Um, good daily routines, uh, aggressive blood pressure control um, is a new one that's actually come out in the guidelines in the last couple of years. Um, I won't go on off, off on a tangent here, but if there's anybody in here that's in the medical field and is familiar with something called JNC8, uh, JNC8 is a, is a, a consortium uh, of, of physicians and specialists who five years ago came out and said that we're going to rework the recommended blood pressure uh, parameters to 140 over 90. I cannot tell you how much I disagree with that. And I rail against that every day. Blood pressure should be aggressively controlled to a, to a goal of 120 over 80, not 140 over 90. I have plenty of stroke literature to support that as well. Um, so outside of preventative things, what else can we do if we start to show signs of memory loss or concerns of Alzheimer's disease? Well, this is where medications come in. 
And going back to what I said earlier, there is no cure for Alzheimer's disease. Again, the best, the best treatment is prevention, as with many, many diseases, uh, but certainly with Alzheimer's disease, prevention is the best treatment. But if we get to the point uh, that we either uh, get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or there is some concern that there is a degenerative condition going on, that's, that's when medications come in. And there are really two types of medications uh, that we use in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease today. Those are the anticholinesterase inhibitors and the NMDA receptor antagonists. And I'll kind of explain these here in just a second. I put the third one in here. I want to see it by a show of hands. How many of you in here have heard of a medication called Aduhelm or Aducanumab, right? Several in here. Um, I bring this up because this is a very, very staunch, um, uh, I guess, debate. Uh, is is the best term. Um, Aduhelm it was, is a medication that was FDA approved for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, early onset Alzheimer's disease, um, last year. Uh, it was approved by the FDA through rapid approval, um, which is now under investigation um, as an aside. But the literature behind Aduhelm was so bad, was so bad, that I decided very early in my practice that I was not going to prescribe it. Um, it is a medication that costs about $54,000 a year. Um, the literature did not show in any equivocal way that it was beneficial in improving cognitive functioning scores. Um, and it comes with its own set of risks as far as cerebral edema or fluid building up in the brain or even uh, uh, bleeding. Scott Petty, we have talked about this before. And uh, the last time I talked, I think I had said that there were no deaths related to Aria H, uh, which, is a, which is a bleeding complication of the brain. That is now uh, an N of one. We have now had our first Aria-related death as a result of Aduhelm. So um, we do not prescribe it at Stillwater Neurology. In fact, I don't know many neurologists in the state of Oklahoma that are prescribing it right now. So that's why I put that in red, um, just to clear up that confusion, um, that it is not really ready for prime time. Yes, sir. So Prevagen is, it is not. So Prevagen is an over-the-counter medication that um, you see a lot of commercials from. It's the one that was developed by jellyfish or from jellyfish proteins. Um, there's no, there's no good evidence that Prevagen does much of anything. In fact, if you look at the, if you look at the ingredients of Prevagen, largely it is amino acids. So it, I mean, it's it's the building blocks of protein basically. Uh, but no, there's not any, there's not any any evidence that it does anything now. To be fair, there's not any evidence that it causes any harm either. And sometimes people get a good placebo effect from it. So, um, so it's kind of an overview of, of how these medications work. Anytime you take a medication, um, that medication attaches to a receptor on a cell and enacts some kind of response, right? Well, in the brain, what we're specifically talking about is how it regulates the chemical signals uh, that regulate the brain function. And those are what we call neurotransmitters. So with our medications, what our goal here is, is to regulate or change the amount of signaling pathways that the neurotransmitters are able to do. Um, and boiling it down to, to uh, kind of its, its, its base, we would either want to increase or decrease the amount of certain neurotransmitters to enact some kind of response. Um, this is just kind of a simple schematic of how the neurons are arranged. Another trivia question. Anybody know how many neurons uh, are in the typical human brain? Do I need to charge happy bucks or anything? Yeah. Nobody knows. Um, <clears throat> billions is correct. So, so about 85 billion, give or take. Um, anybody want to guess what a typical higher primates uh, neuron count is? Chimpanzees, orangutans. Little and gorillas, about 85 billion. Isn't that interesting? About the same. It's about the same. So there's something, something special about the human, human brain. We're a lot better at regulating our synaptic connections. But um, all right. So medication-wise, in the anticholinesterase uh, uh, side of things, we have really three medications. I won't delve into this too much because, again, we need to get to questions. Um, Aricept is the most common by far because it is approved for all stages of Alzheimer's dementia. Um, Razodine, you see down there at number three, I will sometimes use for patients that have uh, dementia associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, but Aricept overwhelmingly is the one that's used, um, I, would, I would estimate 85 to 90% of the time in, 
in most neuro neurological practice. Um, these are generally well tolerated. Um, there is some side effect of, of GI upset and diarrhea um, because of the cholinergic side effects with them, but overall pretty, pretty well tolerated medications. Um, less than 10% of patients have any kind of side effect with this medication. The second one, the NMDA receptor antagonist, there's only one um, called Memantine or Namenda is the brand name. Um, and what Namenda does is it blocks uh, the transmission of glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So if you block the exciting thing, in essence, what you're doing is you're causing inhibition, right? Because you're blocking the thing that excites everything. And that's, that's what we want to do because too much excitement uh, at the neuronal level can actually lead to uh, neuronal burnout uh, and death. That's, again... Namenda is even better tolerated than Aricept. Um, headache is a fairly common side effect of Namenda when you first start taking the medication. Uh, what I'll tell patients is that uh, uh, give it about two weeks. And if you're still having problems with headaches, maybe we need to decrease the dose. Um, but, but Namenda is a very well tolerated medication as well. And here's just kind of a schematic of, of the different medications and where, where they fit um, and what their, uh, what their mechanism of action is. Adjunctive medications. Um, so anybody that's dealt with somebody who is suffering from uh, the terrible throes of Alzheimer's disease will tell you uh, that sometimes behavioral issues uh, start creeping up. Um, disinhibition, um, especially sexual disinhibition, um, is something that can be commonly seen in the later stages of disease. Um, and that's where some of these adjunctive medications come in uh, to help with the neuropsychiatric uh, sequelae that can come along with Alzheimer's disease. Um, specifically, Seroquel down here in the uh, antipsychotics is one that we use pretty readily um, because it's very, very good at stemming out the, um, the disinhibition. And what I mean by that is, is um, I may be revealing too much, but I need to go to the bathroom right now. Um, and the reason that I don't just go to the bathroom right here, even though my body is telling me I need to do that, is because my frontal lobes kick in and they say, now's not the right time, maybe. There, there may be some social, there may be some social uh, blowback from that. Um, so so with, with patients who are having disruption of their frontal lobe functioning, sometimes they are not always able to do that anymore. And so if you have to go to the bathroom, you just, oh, I had to go, right? Um, if you have a, 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 an urge in any way, sometimes those urges are less apt to be inhibited in social situations. And that's, that's why we see some of those behaviors that may be inappropriate in normal social interaction in patients that have more advanced uh, cases of the disease. Um, and, then, and then this is just the fast, um, the fast examination, which is just a staging tool that we use. I won't go too, go too much into that. Because, uh, like I said, I want to get I want to get to everybody's questions. So, um, so that's a very very quick rundown, and I apologize for the speed of that uh, rundown of uh, how we treat Alzheimer's, uh, what medications we use for that, uh, why we treat them the way we do, um, and again, aduhelm or aducanumab is not ready for prime time. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, a lot of people talk about, I didn't hear about this on preventive, but a lot of people talk about brain exercises, whether that's mm -hmm. reading, crossword puzzles, those kind of thing. Is that, is that a, a factor at all? So the, the, the research has shown that when the online games came about, like uh, Lumosity is one that's pretty popular. Um, that question really got kind of a second look. Um, and what the, what the research really shows is that the more you do those games, it makes you good at those games. It doesn't seem to translate into activities of daily living very well. Um, certainly, it's not going to hurt anything, but the more you do crossword puzzles, the better you get at crossword puzzles, right? The more you do those Lumosity games, the better you get at scoring on those, but there doesn't seem to be a good translation into daily life. So, yes, sir. So probably a number of us in this room, including myself, suddenly find themselves um, having difficulty recalling names, mm -hmm. even though we've known a person for a long, long time uh, or whatever. And uh, I'm just wondering, what does that signify? Yeah. So a lot of times uh, that's a very common uh, concern or complaint, especially uh, patients coming into the clinic that I can't remember names. I can't recall them as fast as I used to be able to do. And the answer to that is, is 
probably you're okay. Probably. Because as we age, in fact, another trivia question, what, at what age do we hit our cognitive peaks? This is going to depress everybody in this room. So, so, so thir- I heard a 30, three years. It's 30. We hit our cognitive peaks at the age of 30. So I think we are all on the better side of that. So, um, so as we age, our recall ability tends to go down. Again, give or take after about the age of 30. So a lot of times that is a normal aging process. That is a normal, normal function of just getting older. Where the problem comes in is certainly if you start forgetting family members, right? People that, that you have lived with or in the same uh, daily routine for a long time, or if you start having disruption of what you generally do during the day because of that deficit of not being able to remember people's names. That's where I tell people, maybe we need to take a look. And sometimes if it's not a normal aging process, it's something outside the realm of dementia. Dementia, of course, is the worst case scenario there. But a lot of times we'll work people up and we'll find, oh, your B12 is 100, which is very low, right? People who have B12s that are very low have cognitive problems. People whose vitamin Ds are less than 30 have cognitive problems. And so sometimes it's a very simple fix that has just gone unnoticed uh, or just hasn't been looked at before. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'll tell you what, I'll send you a bill and then I'll just give it over to Hey, yeah, Steve. John, I'm sure you remember the December 20th issue of Wine Spectator. Oh, absolutely. That and was it says, issue uh, number seven. What wine and cheese are a perfect pairing for, to prevent Alzheimer's uh-huh. study finds? <laughs> well, I think the saying goes everything in moderation, right? Um, there, <laughs> there is. Uh, there is certainly evidence that uh, resveratrol, uh, which, is a, which is a compound in, in a lot of red wines, um, is protective against cardiovascular risk factors. So things like heart attack, stroke, things like that. Um, the literature in terms of neurodegenerative conditions, not quite as robust, um, but a glass of red wine a day does seem to lower your stroke risk. So <laughs> not seven glasses of wine a day, but one. Yes. Uh, yeah, go I got it. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, a, a couple of questions. Yeah. Do we are there theories about what causes this? What causes Alzheimer's? So this is something again that's been that's been in the neurological lexicon for a long time. So we've known for a long time through um, autopsy studies that people with Alzheimer's disease have biochemical changes in their brain, and the two main changes that we see on postmortem uh, studies of these brains is that they have a propensity to have a higher level of something called beta amyloid, which is a specific protein that tends to build up in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. The other one is something called tau. So tau protein is another uh, cell signaling protein that tends to be in higher proportion in people that start showing clinical signs of Alzheimer's disease. So the question has raged for decades, and I'm talking back to the 70s. In fact, I studied under a guy uh, named Elliot Ross, who was, uh, who was uh, coined the term aprosodia, um, not important, but it shows you this guy, this was guy was big uh, in this world. Um, and he, he, his theory on this was, is that it was more a tau problem than a beta amyloid problem, but you'll see both schools of thought. There seems to be something in the brains of Alzheimer's disease that changes a cell signaling that allows beta amyloid to increase. And that increase in beta amyloid somehow seems to allow tau to go unchecked. So it's, it's almost like a two hit phenomenon. The amyloid, at least this is, this is what we think, is that the amyloid starts building up years, maybe decades before clinical signs of disease. So, I mean, for all I know, I could be having an increased risk of amyloid or increased amyloid in my brain right now. We don't know what the trigger is. No. So genetics can play into it. Um, I get this question a lot too. If you have a first degree relative defined as mother, father, or um, sibling that has Alzheimer's disease, um, 
outside of very specific uh, genetic mutations, your chance of de developing disease is about 12% higher than the general population. So it's not very much. Um, now, if you have two first degree relatives, that risk goes up higher, um, almost 25%. But one first degree relative with Alzheimer's disease um, actually does not increase your risk very much, um, a lot lower than most people think, right? So, um, so to answer your question directly, we don't really know. We know that these proteins somehow are important. And in fact, Aduhelm, aducanumab, that medication I was talking about, it's what it does is it lowers the amount of amyloid in the brain because the theory was, well, if this protein's there and we can lower it, maybe we can cure the disease. That has not panned out. But so it's, it's more complicated than that. But, uh, but those two proteins somehow are important. All right. Sir. Two questions. Has Alzheimer's increased or is our diagnosis better now than it was 50 years ago? And the second question, have we made any progress towards ALS, which I think is a disease that scares everybody to death? Yeah. Um, so Jim, where's, is Jim here today? McDonald? No. Um, so <clears throat> with, the, with your first question about is it, is it increasing in incidence, um, the answer to that question is yes, it is. Um, and there's a lot of theories as to why that is too, but one of the, one of the main reasons that is, is because we're living longer. We're living longer. Our, our, uh, expected, our, our life expectancies are the highest they've ever been in human history. Um, and so as we age, the probability of developing Alzheimer's disease increases. Um, it's not quite linear. There's a little bit of, of exponential increase there after the age of 65, but we live longer, and so there's more disease. Incidence is higher, plain and simple. Um, as far as uh, detection methods, I think that the Alzheimer's Association has done a really good job at uh, public outreach. Um, and so more people are, um, are aware of the disease and things to look for. Uh, whereas, you know, as an example, 30, 40 years ago, well, you know, mom can't remember who I am. Uh, that's, that's weird. Uh, maybe we need to take her to see the doctor. We have a lot better, we have a lot better, um, uh, public education in this space now. So, so in that respect, um, that's really good because again, the earlier we can diagnose and start treatment, the better the outcomes um, overall. So on your question about ALS, um, so there has not been much, quite frankly. Um, there was a new medication for ALS uh, FDA approved at the end of last year. Um, but it turns out that it's not any better than the two medications that were on the market, Rilazole and uh, Radicava. Um, so it, the quick and short of it is there has not been a whole lot of uh, headway in terms of ALS treatment in the last 20 years, as a matter of fact. Sir. Um, uh, this, I asked this question because I have a very close relative, blood relative of mine, yeah. who's just only about four years older than me. I'm 38. Mm -hmm. uh, she would memory problems, went to a general practitioner, told her to go to a cognitive counselor. After a 30 minute interview, she was diagnosed with um, AD, adult ADHD. Nothing got better. Neurologist finally diagnosed her with early onset dementia. I didn't realize that that happened in your 40s, or that that could happen in your 40s. Mm -hmm. My question is, why is it a general practitioner would send somebody off to a, a counselor, not a doctor for this diagnosis that ends up being completely wrong, and they end up diagnosing her with early onset dementia? How much time do we have? Uh, um, to answer your, to answer the question about why the why a PCP or a GP would do that, I don't know. I really don't. Um, I am an advocate that uh, dementia needs to be diagnosed accurately and early, uh, because again, uh, going back to my statement earlier, the earlier you can treat it, the earlier you can identify it and treat it, the better the overall outcomes uh, for the rest of that patient's life. Right. Um, in terms of um, early onset dementia. So what that term means, early onset just means that you started showing signs of the disease prior to the age of 65, right? Um, there are, it gets, it gets a little into the weeds, but is Alzheimer's disease the right diagnosis? A lot of times outside of the world of neurology, neurodegenerative or cognitive disorders get lumped into Alzheimer's disease. Um, Alzheimer's disease is actually a very specific diagnosis. Um, other neurodegenerative disease you can see up here that sometimes can present similar, similarly to these, but have a different overall clinical course. 
um, that can present earlier. Pick's disease is a really good example of that. Frontotemporal dementia is something that affects people younger in life than Alzheimer's disease and commonly is misdiagnosed at first as early onset Alzheimer's disease. So the question arises, is that actually the right diagnosis in somebody who's 40 years, you know, in their 40s? Uh, because you're right, that would be atypical, especially outside of a strong family history. Um, again, without getting into the weeds too much, early onset Alzheimer's disease, if it actually is Alzheimer's disease, what needs to be looked at is something called APOE4, which is a protein, or excuse me, a gene that encodes a protein called presenilin 1 and presenilin 2, whatever. But APOE4, that genetic mutation has been associated with early onset Alzheimer's disease and is something that should be checked in every person with that diagnosis or who has been given that diagnosis. Because again, it may not be correct. Maybe, maybe she actually has Pick's disease and somebody's misdiagnosed it as early onset Alzheimer's disease, right? <laughs> the answer to that is quite frankly, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm an advocate, I'm a little biased, but I'm an advocate for if you think that you've got a, a an organic cognitive problem, see the neurologist, see it, see a brain specialist. So, sir. Maybe not a quick question, but as far as like diagnosis, is that as far as other than signs and symptoms, mm -hmm. um, what kind of testing? I know that the FDA include that Lumi pulse for the beta amyloid, but mm -hmm. I didn't know what your preferred. Yeah. So there. that's, that's a, that's a really insightful question too. So, um, at its core today, Alzheimer's disease is still a clinical diagnosis, uh, meaning that there's no laboratory tests that we do to, sh to show unequivocally, yep, you have Alzheimer's disease. There are several biomarkers that are being, being looked at right now. Um, brain natriuretic peptide uh, or N-peptide is one of them, uh, but nothing that has been approved up to this point. They're still kind of in the research phase. So Alzheimer's is a clinical diagnosis, but the important thing to do when you make the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease to somebody is that you have ruled out all other treatable or reversible causes of memory loss. Um, because the last thing in the world you'd want to do is diagnose somebody with Alzheimer's disease when in fact they actually have, you know, low vitamin D as an example. I have seen that happen. Uh, in fact, it happens. Um, so there is it, us. So what a neurology is an example. I have a very strict algorithm that I go through. Uh, that includes something called neuropsychological testing, uh, which tests different uh, different fields of cognition, different domains, as we say. Uh, so not just memory, but things like visual spatial sketchboard, executive function, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we do what's called an EEG, uh, electroencephalogram, which checks the uh, tests the electrical activity of the brain, and then we do lab work um, and uh, and imaging as well. Um, now, you can't make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease based on any one of those tests alone, but those tests together start to build a picture, right? Um, and that picture and the way that the patient is presenting are what you use to make the diagnosis uh, ultimately. So mm -hmm. let's give Dr. Red like a great big hand. <laughs>